Good, so good morning. It's been wonderful to see such a hive of activity around this week. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Leslie's been very involved. I've seen her running around doing things and you know the others out there today and even rainy days. It's been wonderful. We sort of this is our spring into spring, spring clean, I think. Which has been well overdue, of course. Perhaps if we make it an annual event, it won't be so well. It won't be so onerous. Okay, so here we are in our seven point mind training, continuing on. You know, we're out of the seven points, we're up to point of, um, transforming adverse circumstances into the path of enlightenment. So the actual verse in the seven point mind training is when the environment and its inhabitants overflow with unwholesomeness, um, sorry, start again. When the environment and its inhabitants overflow with unwholesomeness, transform adverse circumstances into the path of enlightenment, apply meditation immediately at every opportunity. The supreme method is accompanied by the four practices. So we'll unpack this a little bit more this morning, or at least start on this this morning. Um, and so uh, transforming problems into happiness by Lama Zafarumisha, I've been quoting this quite a bit this morning, I think. 2006, I recall, when Rinpoche was going around Australia um, giving teachings, it was on this um, text, Transforming Problems into Happiness. Um, yeah, so as Rinpoche says, in Mahayana thought transformation, also called mind training, this is what we've been looking at, you use whatever problems you experience to generate the realizations on the path to enlightenment with your mind. So when we say realizations, you know, just like in meditation where we get to that point where maybe we've been doing analytical meditation on um, karma, on death, on um, death process, on precious human rebirth, and something really, you know, um, sinks in something really like we have a sense of aha so what we do then is try and stabilize that with um calm abiding men placement meditation to allow that aha to deepen so it's not just some sort of fleeting for a moment there i had something <laughs> i had something it's like when in a dream you think it's so amazing and you wake up and you go damn what was that you know so we want to stabilize that in our mind so when we talk about these realizations, they don't have to be, oh, wow, I've had a, you know, it doesn't have to be some amazing great leap of, you know, completely turning our mind around 180 degrees. So that's what we're aiming for. But it can be, you know, we have all those moments and the more that we, you know, not try and hold on to them when they're gone, but the more that we meditate to deepen that and, you know, the more, um, you know, sort of deepens those imprints in our mind. Okay, so so using the whatever problems, whatever problems you experience to generate the realizations on the path to enlightenment within your mind. So um, just to supplement that, <clears throat> Lama Zopa Rinpoche um, some years ago also um, gave us this as a daily practice, a method to transform a suffering life into happiness, including enlightenment. So you can see this is exactly resonating here. Um, and so just reading the first little paragraph of that, at the beginning of each day, after you open your eyes until enlightenment is achieved and until death, and especially today, so all the activities, of your body, speech and mind, hearing, thinking, meditating, as well as walking, sitting, sleeping, doing your job and so on, do not become causes of suffering and instead become causes of happiness. And especially they become causes to achieve enlightenment. That is, that you transform them into a method for accomplishing benefit and happiness for all sentient beings 
Here is a method for transforming the mind into holy dharma and especially into bodhicitta. I think it's important to set our motivation. Well, it is important to set our motivation in the morning and then to refresh that throughout the day. I mean, I particularly like this one from the Dalai Lama. Every day, think as you wake up. Today, I'm fortunate to be alive. I mean, just that, that we woke up in the same body. How many times do we think that? Oh, I'm still alive today. And what's more, I have a precious human rebirth. So to even to think that sets our mind in a good space for the day, doesn't it? I'm not going to waste it. I'm going to use all my energies, all my energies to develop myself to expanding my heart out to others. So that's pretty, I was just pausing to think, it's quite a tall ask, isn't it? I'm going to use all my energies to expand my heart out to others, to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. So we say these words, you know, we say the refuge prayer, may I become a Buddha, to, you know, for the welfare of all sentient beings and so forth. And we go, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, move on. But if we actually contemplate these deeply and what it actually means in terms of our actions throughout the day, again, it's quite profound. I'm going to have kind thoughts towards others. I could put in only kind thoughts towards others. And we check our mind throughout the day, see how that's going. And then maybe reaffirm, I'm only going to have kind thoughts towards others. I'm not going to get angry. Right? That's our determination, not get angry. So that, as his holding said, you know, when asked if he gets angry, when he sees what's happening in Tibet, he said, I observe the anger arise in my mind, I observe it fade away, one minute. So can we get to that point of, of course, his holding is not saying anger, what do you mean anger? I've never heard of it. He's saying, even he observes it arising in his mind and fade away. And he says, the reason I can do that is from the age of six, I've meditated. So that the, it's giving us an indication of practice that we can get to that observing the anger, but nip it in the butt. Why? Because it's only going to cause us problems. You know, getting angry at Bodhisattva for a nanosecond destroys all the positive merits that you've accumulated for eons. Seeing we don't know who a bodhisattva is, then best not to get angry. But also to think what it does to our mind. It makes our mind really toxic, doesn't it? And it really sets us up for a bad day. We wake up angry. We want to be doing this. <laughs> Saying this a lot. Um, to achieve enlightenment for all beings. I'm going to have kind thoughts towards others. I'm not going to get angry or think badly about others. So again, our mind so easily gets into that trap, doesn't it? It just sort of, oh, somebody even does a tiny little thing that our self-cherishing mind does not want to be the recipient of. And we have a big melodrama about it, big meltdown, and we've got to tell everybody else about it. Then we create divisiveness, disharmony, and, you know, it becomes a huge thing. We, over, you know, elaborate on top. I'm not going to get angry or think badly about others. So that's our commitment. This is the commitment of mind training. I am going to benefit others as much as I can, as much as I can. And then, you know, to the best of my ability. And then when... What we discover, if we really commit ourselves to this, then our ability increases, our ability to benefit others. We find the right words to say in a moment when someone's distressed or not say, just hug them or whatever it is, you know, to, as a, you know, seen the Dalai Lama do when people have been in great distress and wanted to ask a question and then he, he just goes and gives them a hug, they calm down and then they can ask their question. Okay or the one on MasterChef, and then the Dalai Lama was on MasterChef, and this young woman who really, you know, really wanted to please the Dalai Lama, and her dish didn't come out well, and she was crying and apologising, and he just took her hand and he said, oh, yes, look, we all have, you know, 
failures and so forth. And it's, you know, don't worry, I'll enjoy it anyway. <laughs> you know, pacifying. So, yeah. So in that way, you know, we become more skillful ourselves and even we don't think we're doing or saying something, but somebody expresses gratitude for that and you can think, oh, isn't that wonderful? You know, I have made a difference. We're really not aware often that we do make a difference, but we do. Every interaction will make a difference to people, to the environment, to beings. So we can think like that. And this method to transform a suffering life into happiness, Lama Zopa Rinpoche, um, speaking about this at um, one of the re uh, retreats in Bendigo, said, this short Lamrim prayer contains the essence of the whole path to enlightenment. Reciting it mindfully leaves a positive imprint on the mind to actualize all realizations and it directs your life to attain enlightenment as soon as possible for the benefit of all sentient beings by practicing the three scopes and the highest yoga tantra. So this thing of leaving a positive imprint on our minds, not just leaving them, we have to build those up because boy, oh boy, aren't the negative ones just ready to jump up and hijack our mind. It happens, isn't it, constantly. Okay. So if you want to, don't, don't, don't run, it's okay. I'll just read it out and you can... <laughs> You can uh, press the button. So the next one, which is a, still part of this same quote, instead of disturbing you, problems can actually help you develop your mind and even further your progress along the path to enlightenment. So again, we can see how much this is true for, right, uh, for, for us right now, how much we might automatically um, respond or react negatively to perceive problems or difficulties, um, illness, ourself or others, perceived harm, and then escalating it, you know, by because our mind is not subdued, because our mind isn't naturally, spontaneously oriented towards others, though this is what we're training in. Um, yeah, yeah. So instead of creating division, disharmony, unleashing toxic anger and giving self-cherishing a, a free ride. And we could say the untrained mind has done this since the beginning of this time. That's why it's so hard to retrain our mind, to train it towards orienting towards others. But, you know, just to, I think, it's very useful every time throughout the day to notice that. And when we notice that, say, ha-ha, I've caught you, and rejoice in that, that we've caught that moment of negativity. And that way it doesn't escalate. It's like we're shining the light of awareness on it. Without practicing thought transformation, you will be unable to complete your Dharma practice, your inner mental development. Because why? Because that is your inner mental development. So that if we've been coming along and we find that our mind hasn't transformed, then we have to look at what am I not doing? It's not that the Dharma doesn't work, it's like I'm not working it. So we've got all these tools to, to transform our mind, to change perspective, to orient our minds towards others, and that's the whole scope of the mind training, Lojong teachings. Um, and so that, you know, cherishing others more than feeding that self-cherishing mind. This is what this whole Lojong mind training is intended to do. If we do it, right, it doesn't work by magic. It's not like by hearing about it, it's going to work. All right. And then, um, next one. So this is a really good question to use as analysis for ourselves. How do 
you use problems in support of your dharma practice and your attainment of happiness. So rather than the mind of aversion that refuses to have problems or refuses to know about problems, we want to sweep under the carpet, we want to do anything we can to avoid it, just look at, well, how am I doing with this today? How have I gone? How will I, how will I do this tomorrow? How will I use my problems today, the rest of the day, tomorrow? When we know that, you know, we're going to have to have that difficult conversation or we're going to have to deal with whatever situation in our life that we have many. Um, but how can I use it to support Dharma practice? And if we don't have the answer to that, this is what this training is all about. So that we, we turn to this and going, okay, how can I transform this situation? And this is what we're going through, how to do that. So this whole presentation gives us the opportunity to say well how am I going to use it how do problems lead me to attain happiness really you know um, so as Rinpoche says you have to train your mind in two ways first stop the thought of a complete aversion to suffering complete aversion to suffering which reminds me, you know, when my mother did our family shield, our family motto was learn to suffer. I'm like, thanks, mom. <laughs> Very Catholic, yes. <laughs> it's got this, I don't know what the shield means. I know there's a line on there somewhere. It's probably, it's one of those British things in the <laughs> learn to suffer. Thanks, mom. And then when I counted the Dharma, I was like, oh, actually, I can do that. <laughs> Not, I don't have to go looking for suffering, but learn how to cope with that suffering. And that's what this is, you know. How, you know, how, we, how, do we, how do we let go of this thought of complete aversion, this expectation that everything's going to go smoothly when all our experiences, that rarely happens, that we're not going to have any difficulties, we're not going to have any illnesses, we're going to be incredibly comfortable and just look at the world today. I mean, we have all these, as they say, we are creatures of comfort. And we have all of these plush, you know, the mattresses, as you probably already know, <laughs> really get me. I mean, I had to, you know, when my mother was still alive and the nurse suggested she get a new mattress. So I went out shopping and was like, I was traumatized by the shopping experience. It's just like, which do you get? The one that's, you know, three layers and this and that and does this and that and it's like everything. And of course, I got the mattress and my mother said, oh, you use that. I'm happy with mine. <laughs> <laughs> so she was very stoic. I think maybe um, learn a few lessons from her. <laughs> very stoic. I don't care if it's uncomfortable. I'm used to it. So. Yeah. So anyway, we have to look at this. How much I, how much am I just seeking those comforts of this life? There's nothing wrong with being comfortable if we're using that to support our dharma practice. Good mattress. I get a good night's sleep, so therefore I can meditate better. Therefore I can practice dharma better. I can have a clearer mind, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah. But what's our purpose in that? Because if it's just seeking to indulge our senses, that's not going to last very long, is it? And we know that it doesn't last long, and it certainly won't be what we take with us. We don't take our sense consciousnesses with us. You know, we take our imprints on our mind. So, what's most important to develop? So, in a way, if we continue on with this thought of a complete aversion to suffering, we haven't even yet got the first noble truth, you know, the truth that suffering is all pervasive wherever you live, whatever body you're in. And, you know, uh, as we say, the suffering of suffering, the level that animals get, that we get, suffering of change, what we think is happiness turns into 
we well doesn't turn into suffering is actually an alleviation of the previous moment of greater suffering so that we think it's happiness we think it's pleasure well, it is pleasure in relation to the previous moment but that moment then becomes <coughs> unpleasurable right mm. having too much too many slices of cake and starting to feel uncomfortable and we usually stop there don't we hopefully we stop there before it becomes too uncomfortable because something tells us this isn't good for my health or in the classical text when they talk about the um suffering of sitting being a relief from the suffering of standing or the suffering of standing being a relief from the suffering of sitting for too long any of these things our bodies are dynamic they're not made to be still for too long okay so Again, we investigate how our mind has that aversion to the thought of suffering. Not only aversion, but complete aversion and how that arises in our mind. And secondly, you generate the thought of welcoming problems. Now, this, when I first heard, was a bit outrageous. Learn to love your problems like you love ice cream. Now, for those of you who do, um, Love ice cream. <laughs> it's like, really? Your problems. But I do remember in San Francisco when we were putting on a happiness conference and everything was going wrong and I was in the back of the cab going back to the centre from the from the um, conference venue. And I was like, hmm, maybe I'm beginning to love ice cream. <laughs> well, there's so many problems. You can either drown in that or you can change your perspective and go, okay. <laughs> Yeah, something's got to give. Um, and it certainly wasn't <laughs> the situation of the conference. You know, many, if any, every problem that you never even imagined. Anyway, sometimes that's a, a good thing, as, as Rinpoche says, wear your problems like you wear earrings. I'm looking around saying who's wearing earrings, Susan. <laughs> like you wear your earrings. You know, to show them off. <laughs> like an adornment, yeah. And often, like the adornments, the jewels on the on the um, on the manifestations of, of the Buddhas and so forth, is that represents the realizations, different realizations. So, okay. transform that. Really show them off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then the next the so the first point in this in this verse is when the environment and its inhabitants overflow with unwholesomeness, transform, transform adverse circumstances into the path of enlightenment. So as we talk about, these are the times of um, the by degenerations being really rampant and we see this with increasing conflict and not to mention the climate change, environmental, you know, global warming, um, the crops and so forth uh, being attacked by various, uh, well, if not by floods and droughts and so forth, by different insects, viruses, the viruses in the in the bees and oh. uh, yeah, and the cows and all of this. So all of this is more and more happening, and this in these days gets me turning. To, like I just, you know, the Golden Light Sutra becomes my go-to for this again and again and again. So from the um, chapter on the inviolable rights of kings, so thinking that kings are the world leaders, um, in this sutra the Buddha is predicting exactly what's happening right now in the world. So um, when a king, and we could say world leader, Premier, Prime Minister, President, you know, name your world leader type. When a king overlooks the presence of evildoers in his region, in, let's say, the region, his her these days, terrible clandestine acts will ruin and destroy the land. Upon arrival of a foreign army, the country will utterly succumb And we see this right now with Ukraine 
hasn't utterly succumbed, thankfully. Resources and race too will fall away. Those who amassed wealth through trickery and deceit will rob each other entirely of means. When a king does not perform the function for which kingship has been bestowed, in other words, be a leader, um, they demolish their own realm as the elephant lord destroys a lotus pond. Unfavorable winds will arise, unfavorable rains will fall, the sun and moon will be unfavorable, and likewise the planets and stars. Always think about when His Holiness sent Kirti Tinchak Rinpoche to Antarctica to help realign the planet, you know, because of all these environmental disturbances. And of course, we still have environmental disturbances, but through the power of that practice, how much worse would it be? You know, with that, we don't know that, you know, holy beings who who have um, the, developed the city of being able to work with the elements. You know, I remember years ago, people say, when you're inviting these lamas, especially to Australia, you should be asking them to do all these practices to rebalance the elements. Right? I don't know if we've ever requested that. When a king is negligent, famine will descend upon the land, seeds, crops, flowers, and fruit will cease to grow and flourish. When a king overlooks those who do wrong in their realm, unhappiness will befall. And where don't we see this? The um, increase of unethical world leaders, I mean, particularly on the world stage I'm talking about here. Yeah. Um, you know, that we, we see that, and we see that not only that it's happening, but they get away with it. That's what's a mystery to me. And as as you know, when Lama Zopa Rinpoche was asked before Trump was elected, um, you know, the very first question at that retreat was, "Will Trump win the election?" That was to Rinpoche. <laughs> and Rinpoche said, uh, "The U.S. will have." the leaders it has the karma for, the world will have the leaders it has the karma for. In other words, it's a reflection of that collective karma, you know, like we see in the, I was reading the other day that the majority of the Republican Party there still support Trump despite mm -hmm. everything. And you say, well, this, this is a reflection not only of the degeneration of the world leader, but all of those along with them and then the mindset. So it's not particular to the US, it's increasing throughout the world. And that makes our Dharma practice not only more difficult, but more profound, right? When we engage in any moment of virtue, because it's not, of course, it is amongst people who are committed to a spiritual path, but that percentage has declined. You know, we we're talking yes last night about. Do really even people listen to religious leaders? Do they? Does that make a difference in the world? You know, we're having that conversation. We didn't answer it. <laughs> we left it open um, so that we can see this is a time of degeneration. Mayhem will prevail in the land by weapons too. It will give way. Copernic strife and disease of every variety will come to be, and that's part of the you know, five degenerations of we have all these mental illnesses arising, it's what's happening now, increased, you know, viruses and so forth being released and, you know, seeing all these physical ailments we've never heard of before, epidemics, so forth. Um, shooting stars will rain down, likewise mock suns will shower. This is predicted at the end of the, you know, that, um, world system so when this world go towards going out of existence and on the you know when we had the COVID um, become epidemic um, uh, declared an epidemic his holiness the Dalai Lama said yes and we'll have famine we'll have um, fire and and w great winds conflict between all beings from you know, on the grand scale down to interpersonal relationships and that will be the end of, you know, this eon 
that will be eons of destruction of this world system. So we see this happening. People will pillage one another, seizing homes, resources, and wealth. And we see that when there are earthquakes um, and so forth, and, and people, you know, rob everything from the shop. We also see shop owners, you know, giving away things freely. So it's not all on the bad side, but we do see this, like as if people feel they have the right to things, stealing, basically. Um, region by region throughout the land, they will slay one another with arms. Strife, squabbles and deception will tear apart their lands. Demons will enter into the region. Terrible diseases will plague them. Even the venerable ones, their ministers and retinues too, will succumb to wickedness and deceit. With those devoid, when those devoid of virtue become venerated in the land, those Lord abiding and virtuous ones will always be victimized. So this we saw like with the Kadampa um, masters practice, uh, 10 innermost jewels of the Kadampa practice of so being out of as I say, um, being out of, um, not sync, but anyway, you know what I mean, with society, out of step with society, and then, you know, not being valued, but being criticised for that. Um, when the corrupt are esteemed and sublime dishonoured, three things, famine, thunderbolts, and death will occur in that place, fruit and crops, will have no taste and no potency thereafter. Beings sickened with disease will fill these regions completely. Large, sweet fruit will sh shrivel, becoming bitter and sharp. Play, humour and fun, the pleasures of previous times now ripe with infinite delusion, will lose the touch of joy. Sounds quite depressing, really, doesn't it? So, as I say, you know, the, this this is what we're experiencing in the world today, but we're nowhere near the end of it. So it's like, how bad is it going to get? It's what I think. You know, with climate changes, I, um, with the global warming, it's like, how much heat can our human bodies tolerate um, over a period of time? I don't understand why people go to Marble Bar when it's really 50 plus or whatever, 50 degrees as a tourist destination. Are you crazy? <laughs> I'd be like, go to Antarctica before it completely melts. And that's you know, what's happening now. So <laughs> anyway, maybe not Antarctica, it's a bit extreme. Let's just sort of stay in the middle of all that. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, people unfortunately won't have to travel anywhere. It'll come right to us. It's happening already, isn't it? I can't believe the first summer I had here. And people said, oh, December's hot, but then it gets hotter. And in December, it was like 46 degrees. <laughs> and I'm like, why would anyone live here? <laughs> Where was that? Huh? Where was that? Here. Oh, yeah. It was the first year I was here, like mm -hmm. nearly two years ago. And it's a freak heat. Little did I know. I mean, it gets hot. <laughs> we know. <laughs> yeah. I decided that above 46 was intolerable for me. I mean, I have been in 48. 49. That's intolerable. To this body. Yeah. But I think it's a good thing to think about as we look at the global warming and just think how much, you know, can we tolerate? And we can understand if there's going to be more disease, physical, mental health disease, more conflicts, more heat, literally, then of course we can see that, you know, human lifespan will go down. And yeah, we see that happening. Mm. I think just checking the history. Yes. So in mind training like the rays of sun about the environment, 
is filled with circumstantial results of the 10 unwholesome actions. And we don't think about this in the world, do we? It's what said in the Gotham Art Sutra, what the Buddha said. We don't see that <clears throat> the environmental impacts are a result of um, unwholesome actions. I mean, we can in some way say that this is the result of mining the ground and you know, depleting it of resources and so forth. But I don't think we understand this enough. Um, unwholesome actions and the sentient beings who inhabit it think of nothing but disturbing emotions and do nothing but unwholesome deeds. For this reason, these reasons, the gods, nagas and hungry spirits who favour such black actions are invigorated and increase in their power and strength. Again, thinking of when Lama Zopra Rinpoche um, was in Bendigo 2011 and manifested stroke. The way he described it, he said the Naga came in on the left side and grabbed his power of speech. That's how he described it. Right? So we can think of, we don't have to think about literally some being that looks like this or that, but the disturbing forces that grab our physical or mental powers. Um, as a result, spiritual practitioners in general are troubled by many, many interferences. So the thing is to expect there are going to be many, as we say, obstacles, interferences and so forth in our Dharma practice and what we're invited to do here is like say, oh, great, here's another obstacle that I can turn into an opportunity for Dharma practice. Of course, when we're in the thick of it, this is not the way we're thinking at all, is it? But this is what we're saying. And those who have entered the door of the great vehicle are beset by various adverse factors. Um, under such circumstances, if you engage in this kind of practice, lojong training, and are able to transform hostile influences into conducive factors, to see opponents as supporters and harmful elements as spiritual friends, you will be able to use adverse conditions as supporting factors in the achievement of enlightenment. In this context, Geshe Chengawa said to Geshe Shawapa, it is amazing that your disciples of mind training take support from adverse factors and experience sufferings as happiness. So yes, it's amazing. Thinking that, you know, suffering of suffering, suffering of change, or pervasive suffering, and the invitation to use that to for our own Happiness, long-term happiness, is really, as I said, very, very amazing. Okay. On the mind training? Uh, it's a bit of sharp, isn't it? Mind training like the race of oh. sun. Uh, it's on page 81. Okay, next, next one. So in Transforming Problems into Happiness, Lama Zopa Rinpoche cites a text by uh, Job Jukchen, Jigme Tempe, Tempe Nima. So he was in Tibet in the late 19th century, early 20th century in Eastern Tibet. He was a son of Dujon Lingpa, um, so a great uh, Nyingma scholar. And so at the time of his holiness, the 13th Dalai Lama, and um, uh, the current Dalai Lama, 14th Dalai Lama, has praised him a lot, quoted him a lot and praised him a lot um, for his being Rime, non-sectarian, of his, his embracing, so a Nyingma practitioner, Nyingma scholar, but embracing all the Kagyu, Galupa, Shakya, Sakya and Nyingma teachings, and we could say in a similar way that Lama Tsongkhapa did, coming from the Guluk, well, what then became a Guluk tradition, of really being very much 
um, schooled in all the traditions and drawing from those. And we see this with Lama Zabu Rinpoche having told the Geshe's you must teach all the different traditions. You must have a sort of Rime approach. The differences are minimal, but the benefits are, are greater. So this very flexible, open mind to be able to draw on the traditions to present powerful um, teaching. So then Lama Zopa Rinpoche also refers to this, that um, transforming problems into happiness is actually a commentary on um, uh, the, so Drogjibshin Jigme Tempo Nima is a, a Zogchen Rinpoche, and so Lama Zopa Rinpoche takes his text using suffering and happiness in the path to enlightenment as the foundation for transforming problems into happiness. So that's the sort of context <clears throat> behind this. So the two points of training in taking adverse circumstances and path to enlightenment, transforming through conventional truth, which is what we're looking at now, and transforming through ultimate truth, so that came under the previous point, 2A, but in the present Guluk presentation, that's always you know, taught much later, the teachings on ultimate truth, you know, on the profound um, wisdom realizing emptiness. So that's, that's taught later. So at the moment, we're focusing on the training through conventional truth. In other words, what we can do right now, let's say. <clears throat> So then, next one. So this is um, these four points in using uh, and training in seeking suffering as the blessings, seeing suffering as the blessings of the Buddhas and Buddha and Gurus. Three trainings related in the small to the small scope, three to the middle scope, and three two sorry two to the middle scope, two to the great scope. Next one. So the first point, seeing suffering as the blessings of the Buddhas and Gurus. So Lama Zabharun Pache says, when you have a problem, think this is a blessing of the Buddha. This situation is purifying me by exhausting my negative karma, helping me to train my mind in Mahayana thought transformation so that I can achieve enlightenment for the sake of all beings. I welcome this problem as an opportunity for me to train my mind. So this exactly resonates for when I got the instruction from Chodan Rinpoche when I was in hospital with pneumonia quite some time ago and saying, well, Lama Zopra Rinpoche would say, amazing, 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 wow, 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 like great. <laughs> so he was sort of saying, well, you know, it's, you know, having this suffering now and by the way, he was teaching on this seven-point mind training at the time and I was in hospital and people would be bringing me the teachings. I was missing recordings and so I could, I was listening to it. Don't know how much went in, you know, to my befuddled mind at the time, but anyway. So, but it was like, fantastic, better than suffering eons in hot hells. And it's like, okay, given eons of hot hells, bring it on. And then I was like, Oh, not too much. <laughs> like, how much can I cope with? Right. I'm very sorry, but this is me, <laughs> a very dull practitioner. Anyway, so, but it was very reassuring to think like that, to think, oh, actually, if the option is eon suffering in hot hells, hey, you know, if I can purify that in this life and, and I have the conditions that, um, Okay, you have to have the ripening of that past negative karma, but having a conditions that can ameliorate your situation. You know, there I was in Sydney, had good hospital care. In fact, one nurse he'd come in and say, Can I do something for you? You never ask for anything. <laughs> I said, There's nothing to ask for. Like, I'm here, I'm happy. <laughs> said, no, but my job is to help you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so um, also if we look at say Chubu's commentary the actual who the 
the first commentary by Say Chilbu, the direct student of, I guess it's Chokowa. Um, Okay, he says, view the perpetrator of harm as a desirable, as desirable, endearing and close to your heart. So this is when we're doing no, you know, that first the step of mind training of of, of um sorry, the step of mind training of um seeing all sentient beings as as dear, as a you know, with affectionate love, cultivating affectionate love for him, for them. So of course we start off generally with those close to us that, you know, with ourselves, with those close to us, and then those that we label strangers who are not so familiar, and then get to the difficult ones. And so here it's saying <laughs> some variety of the perpetrator of harm, see them as desirable, endearing, close to your heart. This is challenging. You should view sickness and suffering as possessing similarly beneficial qualities. So often people think, you know, I remember a friend of mine, not Buddhist, um, said, what, you know, who was chronically ill, had was chronically mentally and physically ill. And really, if you could get out of bed, it was a good day. And she said, I'm I'm not leading a full life. I mean, you couldn't argue with that. And feel into this is like, what would the Buddha say? And you know, if we view it like this, that this is a great opportunity to purify <laughs> a lot of past harm, rather than thinking, you know, where she was going was like, oh, this must be a punishment, which it's, it's not. I mean, we're human, we get sick, we, you know, but from what we're asked here is to see it as, as ben giving us beneficial qualities. Because, you know, I think of, my friend that I'm I'm referring to, that she gave a lot of love, she, you know, and she was available on the phone a, a lot when she wasn't sleeping to other people. She cared for her, her great love was dogs, so she had a few dogs to look after. Um, totally um, spoiled them, I have to say, <laughs> but cared for them as well. Um, but also her her friends, like she would give, you know give advice and like whatever she could do she did and even when she was not very well she volunteered and you know she couldn't always make it to the end of the day but volunteered to you know help others so in that way we can say it also gives us opportunities it strips us back to what is important you know for us even you can track leprosy so that would have been one of the worst things time you should reflect this will bring future sufferings to the fore this will bring future sufferings to the fore in other words bring them to ripen now this life is but a momentary event and if i were not afflicted by leprosy and illness my mind would be embroiled in the chores of this life leading me to accumulate negative karma you can think like that can't we it's just like well, i can't I can't create negative karma because I can't get out of bed. <laughs> and I'm sleeping most of the time. <laughs> and when I talk to people, I'm mostly just very gracious for what they're doing to help me. Although, yeah, sadly, I did read this um, guy who was... Um, who got the, what is it, one punch. Mm -hmm. And he's, 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 it's, it's like he's got brain damage. And he's very angry. So we're fortunate that we have the, the Dharma teachings that say, like that voice from Chodan Rinpoche when I was feeling miserable and, you know, poor me, I'm not at his teachings, was to hear his voice saying, great, you know, it's a great opportunity to purify. Um, Given that illness and so on end this mundane way of life abruptly and enable me to encounter Dharma, they help me take the essence of this bodily existence. 
So I see that, um, you know, with the people who've encountered the Dharma in prison, I mean, they would never have encountered Dharma if they didn't get to prison. That was the circumstances in which they encountered Dharma, so many of them. I mean, sadly, there are a few who were previous Dharma practitioners who ended up in prison. You think, oh, gosh, we didn't do our job well on those, did we? But, the, but usually it is. And now taking those conditions and using it to say, okay, I've got this opportunity, this one-time opportunity to turn my life around. Sometimes I say, you know, while I'm here, you know, I've got two years, you got to help me so I don't go back to the gangs when I get out. That sort of attitude. And then in relation to sickness, as, as Say Chobo says, um, view leprosy and sickness. I mean, leprosy is a sickness. I guess it's singled out because um, this mind training became the leper's dharma. So through, um, so by teaching the lepers, singling out leprosy with heartfelt, uncontrived joy, with heartfelt, uncontrived joy, or if you like like me, you've got to work at that to get to, you know, we don't want to say fantastic another problem in life, but if we can train like our, you know, like Lama Zabarimashe modeled, you know, amazing, amazing, wow, 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 what an opportunity. Furthermore, think sickness and suffering engender true renunciation in me. I think that's true. For without suffering, there can be no true renunciation. That is true, isn't it? What are we renouncing? If we don't experience suffering like you're in the God realms and you're just living it up, living the good time, there's no sense of wanting to give up that because we seek the comforts. We seek the pleasures of our senses. It's only when all of that falls apart and we realise we've just frittered away all this good karma and go plunging down. That is like you're going to turn to the dharma. Most people turn to the dharma when there's, or you know, seek out the dharma when there's a crisis in life, isn't it? I'm not saying everybody here, it's been a crisis in life. Some people are just sort of, because of the strength of the imprints in our minds, we gravitate towards a spiritual path that will profoundly help us. And so, you know, either one way or the other, either through strong past imprints, and in any case, even those like the ones in prison, I think you must have strong imprints from past lives. Out of all the things you could be involved with in prison, and there's some pretty terrible ones, um, but even wanting to turn your life around it is ripening in whatever way is a ripening of, of you know strong imprints. And if it took the condition of prison for them to do it, so be it. If it takes the condition of being in the hospital, so be it. It usually takes it when what do we say the chips are down. Then it's like, oh, now I really want to practice hard. <laughs> so we think that all these adversities definitely help us to dispel the afflictions of our mind which is to realize the intent of the teachings so thinking oh, most kind pneumonia most kind <laughs> one who pushes all my buttons could you welcome all the language that way yes you know because we have it, yeah more and okay. more as i'm going to die young yeah yeah, I mean, what's the alternative? Either yeah. you're going to welcome old age or you're going to say, oh, no, I pass on old age. Or... Yeah, which only makes you unhappy and those around you unhappy because they see that distress. And so those of us who have these profound teachings have a way through that, you know, and that old age um, becomes an opportunity to continue practice. You know, I saw with, with my mother, you know, who was scared to learn to meditate, even though she got into some very esoteric teachings of the, you know, within Catholicism, as a good Catholic. Then, um, but she was scared. She had this idea that, well, if I meditate, I'll stop breathing. And as much as I tried to convince her that won't happen. 
<laughs> not as a result of meditation. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, I did sort of, consider, you know, as she was, because the thing is, she was someone with a mind, a very sharp mind to the end. And so for her to be so physically constrained was a deep suffering. And she was annoyed at still being alive because she was giving up on life. And, which is so sad because it's like but with that sharp mind you can still use your own mind you can still you know and she did for something she tried to finish off all the local history she was doing and whatnot. But, you know to have as a practitioner to say if I have if I have that sharpness of mind my old age at least with what I have now to use it now to train in this so that that becomes our default position as we age and that's like, ah, I can still meditate. Mm -hmm. I can't move, but I can meditate. That's the retreat I've been waiting for all my life. <laughs> <laughs> you can think like that. So, and then. Uh, mind training raised the sun has a comment on this as well. Um, Mr. Weatherford. Um, yeah, I have read that one. Yeah. We're moving right along. So through conventional truth, so, okay, we've got that um, first point, yes, and that's why I raised the one about Chodhim Rinpoche. It's that idea, it's a blessing of the Buddhas, it's a blessing of the Gurus, mm -hmm. you know, to really take that on board, to see it as a blessing, not as a punishment. Okay. All right, so in the small scope, using suffering to train in, these are the three points to train in, using suffering to train in taking refuge, using suffering to purify and stop harmful actions, using suffering to find joy in positive actions. So the next one, using suffering to train in taking refuge. So this quote is it's up on this slide and up on the next from the Dalai Lama. You must think there are uncountable results of past karma I have yet to experience. Oceans of samsaric suffering. So through our awareness of the teachings of past, of the karmic imprints and the way that we know we have yet to experience oceans of samsaric suffering, check your mind. Just check how your mind is right now and think, Yep, got a long way to go. Only the triple gem has the power to liberate me from all true suffering and the true causes of suffering. So here we have also the second noble truth. And since the triple gem has the power to liberate me completely from all samsara, all samsara why not from these problems I'm experiencing right now? Therefore, no matter how difficult my life is, I won't give up refuge in the triple gem. No matter how many problems I have, I won't give up Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. We know that is the heaviest negative karma we can have is to actually give up the Dharma, having encountered the Dharma. And why someone would do that is because they, when they hear refuge, they think you're going to save me from all my problems. And it just doesn't work that way. And again, when I was in hospital with pneumonia that time, the woman in the next bed said to me, how do I become Buddhist? And I said, because um, I, I knew she was Christian. I used to say, yes. Do you have a faith? Yes. I'm Christian. I said, well, talk to God. And she said, I keep ringing him up, but he's just not answering. 
And I said, well, it's pretty busy. <laughs> so it's not going to go to get any better. Like, I'm sorry, that Buddhism is not going to take you away your suffering you're experiencing right now. And she was in a very difficult situation and which had totally freaked her out. And so 24 seven, she had the TV on and she would ring the buzzer and to the point where the nurses stopped coming. So the rest of us in the ward rang the buzzer for her. And then they clued onto that as well. And I thought, oh, she doesn't really have an emergency because the buzzer's not working, you know, strategy's not working. And there's like, no, this is realist. <laughs> but, you know, she her high anxiety was, she's gonna have to be going into a nursing home when she gets out because the guy who was caring for her could no longer lift her. And yeah, he was elderly as well. So, so. So we can take something like this, no matter how my difficult my life is, I won't give up on refuge in the triple gem, no matter how many problems I have, I won't give up Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. You can take that as a mantra and use it as a mantra to, to give ourselves that conviction and determination to, um, even we think, well, I'm never going to give up on the Dharma anyway, I'm solid here. But to be able to, again and again, take refuge as many times as we can especially in the midst of our problems, you know, to, it can be very powerful. Again, when I, um, when this conference of every problem is in San Francisco, <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so this day, I knew I had to sack the AV guy. And, you know, sacking anybody is not really... <laughs> <laughs> something I've ever done, had much experience of, let alone in a Dharma center, let alone, I mean, he wasn't a Dharma practitioner, he was outsourced to this AV company, but I knew I had to, and I thought, I don't have the power to do this, so I stood there on the altar behind me that had Mahakala, and I'm like, right, I need you right now, Mahakala, please, and I, I just thought, channel Mahakala, and I was able to just like, Give him a second, he left and <laughs> got through that one. So, you know, this sense of taking refuge in difficult times, you know, calling on the powers of the Buddhas, of the Gurus, and so forth. You know, what would what would his holiness do in this situation? What would the of the situation and so forth? Whoever we call on, um, really, you know, gives us power, gives us strength because we have a conviction in Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And in our goodness. Use your problems in this way to train your mind in refuge and strengthen your reliance on Buddha Dharma Sangha. So again, it's uh, helping us, the more we do this, is like developing a resilience. This is the experience of you know being in the Dharma, a sense of inner strength, resilience, courage, um, you know, to step out of the comfort zone. And to actually um, enhance our ability to take actions at times of adversity, actions that we didn't think we were capable of. And I think, you know, well, I don't think I've observed, and many others have observed that, you know, teachers like the Lama Zopa Rinpoche have, have given us all sorts of advice to take on roles that people were. I do have any competency, any skills for this role, and yet putting you in roles where you have to, you have to meet the occasion. You have to engage in things that you didn't think you could possibly do, and you find it. It's sort of like in giving us the opportunity to be empowered and to develop our skills that we didn't think we have, qualities we didn't think we had enough of. And yet we're placed in those situations um, in the Dharma again and again and again. You know, Lama Yeshi would say, the Dharma Center is your training ground. You know, all of us is our training ground. And it is true, isn't it? Those who have been around for a while, just like, you want me to do what? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I do recall somebody crying when they were made, when they were appointed director of this center. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, of course you say, thank you, Rupesha, and then big goal, okay. <laughs> if Lama Zoka has faith in us, we must have faith in ourselves. You have to think like that. 
um, using suffering to next one using suffering to purify and stop harmful actions so here it says think to yourself this problem is a teaching for me so we're having to use all angles that we can to convince our freaking out mind this problem is a teaching for me it is teaching me that if i don't like this problem i must abandon its cause my own non-virtue here again the second noble truth that you know suffering has causes all these problems difficulties and situations that arise have causes and the cause is my own karma and afflicted states of mind which then cause me to create non-virtue which is what i need to purify with regard to any past negative karma, the first thing to do is to purify by applying the four opponent powers and then abstain from committing the negative karma again. In this way, the problem becomes an extremely beneficial teaching. So the four opponent powers, as we know, the four opponent powers of generating a mind of regret which is said, said to be the greatest power the more great our regret means it's more genuine like from the depths of my heart i regret saying doing whatever non-virtue think of the consequences for myself think of the consequences for others um and then you know we take refuge for a dharma sangha and we generate a mind of bodhicitta of depending on other sentient beings who who in, towards whom I create these non-virtues in the first place. But then if I can cultivate the opposite state of mind of cherishing these others, cherishing these others, even they've given me this problem, this difficulty, this opportunity to transform my mind. Um, and Applying the remedy, a powerful purification practice, like tomorrow afternoon we have budget cycle practice here. And that's all nicely packaged, presented very clearly for us with the four opponent powers included. And then the important one of restraint, of really not just, oh, you know, whatever I can do, 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 of really a commitment to restrain from creating non-virtues again, to practice ethical conduct, to not do harm. Because it's going, we're going to have the karmic consequences of that, and we're just going to continue on again and again and again and again, wallowing in our own self-cherishing suffering. Okay, so um, as it says, you know, in the eight verses, number two, is eight verses. Vigilant, the moment a delusion appears in my mind. You know, I apply the four opponent powers just as Lama Atisha would do. Like get off his horse and do budget suffer so immediately, place his stupor there. Because of seeing that you have to immediately purify, otherwise it festers in your mind. We all know that. You know, we get a grudge and that festers and it totally makes our whole mind toxic. And then we start talking to others about it, it makes their minds toxic, etc. It has a knock on effect let alone that it stays on our mind and and grows lifetime to lifetime. So vigilant, the moment appears in my mind, which means we have to have the mindfulness to see it straight away, to be able to purify it straight away. Next one, we'll I think probably have to finish up with this one. We'll see how we go. Are uh, using so this is all still the small scope using suffering to find joy in positive actions. So positive actions of ourselves, the positive actions on of others. You know, when I get look at the news feed in the morning and I see they've got a um, little section that says good news and reading, it's usually about great projects that people are doing and so forth, things they're doing in their community. And we can be inspired by that every morning and rejoice in that. Um, anytime we hear uh, the good deeds of, of others, you know, or within our family, within the community, within the country, within the world, 
you know, because it wasn't, it was so, oh, well, it was so many years ago in the 80s in the US, somebody started a good news newspaper. In the days we still had newspapers. Do we still have newspapers? I think there are still newspapers, aren't there? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, anyway, they went out of business because in some ways you can say that's good because to make the news, it, it's something that's not usual, which is the bad news. But the sound of bad news is pretty prevalent, isn't it? We need those good news stories to, and then to take those, any positive actions that we hear about, any positive actions of ourselves, taking joy in, in that, you know, joy is the most powerful emotion, really, joy. You know, because as Lama Zaparimsha says, we don't rejoice enough in our own positive qualities, our own positive actions. That's why I like our community newspaper. Yes. There's good news stories there. Yes, there are in the it's community so... news. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the seniors one. Or... I don't it's know if it's a seniors one. You know, the one that Marlene used to work on. It was, what was that one? It seems to, anyway, when I'm down in Bunbury, they have that newspaper. And she used to work on that. She used to help me. Uh, amongst so many of her jobs, I can continue to rejoice in that, <coughs> her, many, her many volunteering roles. Um, and it's full of good stories as well, inspiring stories. Yeah, community news. Yeah, let's go for that. Um, say to yourself, if I really want to find happiness, which is the opposite of suffering, then I have to go, I have got to make an effort to practice its cause. I have to make that effort, which is a positive action. Think about this in detail and from every angle. So we really analyze it deeply from every angle and dwell on the implications, the results are going to be the results of that. I would say dwell in the results. Then in every possible way, do whatever you can to make your positive beneficial actions increase. So whatever it takes, you know, a walk in nature that gives you a pause to think, oh, this is what I really love. You know, this is what's important to me. Connecting with nature, connecting with others. Etc. So, finish up with this um, final uh, quote from for today, from Say Chilwu. Uh, not so we don't need to we don't need to scroll that through. Okay, at this point, um, when you learn to train your mind in this manner, all activities of your body, speech and mind and everything that appears in the field of your senses will be transformed into the two accumulations. So accumulation of merit and accumulation of wisdom by training our mind in this way. We get those two. From that point onward, you'll obtain the spiritual practice that ensures nothing is wasted. then um, yeah so we'll, we'll leave it right there for today hey i'm happy to leave it on joy um it's a good place to leave it i've always you know uh i've only seen mission joy three times so far and i haven't seen it probably for about a year you know the film that was done between the dalai lama and um desmond tutu where the Dalai Lama couldn't go to South Africa um, to celebrate Desmond Tutu's birthday. He wasn't allowed in, so Desmond Tutu went to him, and this was in 2015. And so they made that film at the time. And from their lives of adversity, what they're sharing is joy and silly, you know, silly um, jokes <laughs> with each other, especially when Desmond Tutu is trying to get the Dalai Lama to dance. <laughs> Because as as monastics, we 
you know, take a vow not to do that, not to dance. And so, and so he's like trying to avoid dancing at all cost and he's being ribbed by Desmond Trudeau, but they're laughing along at the same time. And, but, you know, both of them also talk about the adversities they've experienced in their lives and yet have this lightness of being. And that's an example, you know, coming from a Christian tradition and a Buddhist tradition of transforming their minds into joy. And that's very... Wonderful, very endearing, and you can't help but experience joy as you watch it. Okay, good place to stop. We'll dedicate dedicate this morning to um, the growth of joy in our minds. So, page seventeen. Gewadi no hodo da. Lama Hassan Gedrogione, Drohwa Chikyam Mahalopa, Deheye Sahalago.